clear like this? <laughs> okay, that's great, because other speakers were sometimes losing the microphone, so maybe if you can't hear me because the thing drops down, then just raise your hand and I'll put it there. Um, because I'm a woman, so I can't scream loudly, only when I'm mad at men, then I can do it very well, but mostly the time I'm not so um, angry. So let's just do this in a clean and mean way. Um, thank you all for joining. I'm going to tell you something about continuously delivering, continuous delivery. Um, I, was, I was asked to start somewhat later, so um, I think it's time now. Um, I work for uh, an insurance company from the Netherlands. It's Klaverblad Verzekeringen. Uh, I think it's not really um, understandable for you, but it's Klaverblad Insurance Company. Um, we have an annual premium income from 200 million, so um, we have about 400 employees. It's not a really big company. Uh, what I like about the company is that one to five people is uh, in IT. Uh, because we self-automate everything, <laughs> we don't like anything off the rack because it's bad and we think we can do better. Um, so, um, we lately the CEO of the company even thought he could um, self um, automate an, um, a version controller system, so it's really almost ridiculous how much we self-automate. But it's fun to work there because it gets you a lot of freedom to do things that are fun, so that's good. Um, we have uh, life insurance and property liability insurance, so uh, we cover all branches. And we do direct sales and we also do sales through um, an intermediate uh, broker. So also there the IT has some um, uh, well, challenges because you have to um, make a way for all the distribution channels for all the products to um, efficiently be out there. Um, then something about myself, I'm Kim van Wilgen, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, currently I'm head of IT, uh, I'm nerd at heart. Um, I started uh, at some point to um, uh, do uh, uh, math as a study, but I was a little bit lazy, so I just went into a job and uh, a long time I was at the business side. Um, mostly people look a little bit dirty when I say that. Um, luckily for me, I was able to make the transition to IT uh, a couple of years ago. So now I'm at the right side, uh, although I still feel I don't really fit in because most people from IT still think of me like, ah, oh, you, you were a business person. <laughs> I hate that. Um, well, that's uh, enough about me, I think. Oh yeah, and it's my first time, so be gentle. <laughs> um, what we did at the insurance company is really cool because um, we have a greenfield reboot of the full insurance um, IT. Um, I think this is a chance you hardly ever get in the market. We have a lot of cash uh, on the bank um, and we thought, well, we have an old mainframe system and we have uh, all this money and the mainframe system, we can't find any people who could maintain this. Um, we are all, uh, we have all these new channels, we have all these new challenges to deliver. So what we are going to do is we're going to build it from scratch and make a modern um, IT environment. Um, we tried that for the first time in the year 2000. I wasn't head of IT then, so don't blame me. Um, we tried it for the second time in the year 2004. <laughs> And we tried it for the third time in the year 2008. And then we did another restart somewhere around 2011. And every time the project just got another name. But um, yeah, what it shows is that we aren't really very good at self-automating. Um, and we aren't really very good at greenfield automating. Um, but uh, we are very um, full of ourselves to think that we could start again. <laughs> Um, in the year 2014 uh, with yet another project to Greenfield try and automate the full insurance um, administration. Um, we did well, some things different. We tried to adopt Agile working principles um, and the, well, it really started with Agile because it was um, uh, somewhat more lightweighted and we tried to prove that this time could be different, so we wanted to early deliver value. And what we got, got as a present was DevOps, because everybody said, well, if you want Agile, you have to be responsible uh, up until production. So you have to do something about culture. 
Um, what we also got was continuous delivery. Um, I totally underestimated that one because everybody said, well, that's just a simple, nice pipeline and you can um, automate the build and it's reliable. And well, I thought, well, who wouldn't want it? Um, right now I'm a little bit wiser and I think, well, it's a shipload of work. Um, and we also did it with microservices. Um, and these things work together and that's not always um, making the task much easier. Um, how does it fit together? Well, you want Agile um, to deliver value in the hands of the customer, not when she's this age, but when she's this age. Um, and we weren't very good at it, as so I clearly stated, because we started doing this from the year 2000, and in 16 years, you think you could build some insurance administration. I think most of you can do that. Um, mostly because we do this with something like 20 people, uh, the other 60 are running the current administration, and the total uh, exists of 80 people. Um, well, if you want to deliver value in the hands of the customer, um, you have to be able to deploy very frequently. Every time you, you um, manage to automate some features, you want to deliver them to the customer. Um, and if you want to deliver value, you have to be able to do that continuously. Um, in a really repeatable and reliable uh, way. That's why you get continuous deployment or continuous delivery. Um, the microservices architecture just made it more needed for us because you have somewhat like 100 components right now. We are in production, so we actually managed to make this um, administration. It's not finished, um, but um, uh, right now we have something like 100 components, we're still counting. And if you want to deploy them individually, which is one of the things microservices is about, um, and your process has a lot of manual tasks, then the uh, chances of making errors will be so big that you are constantly um, putting your landscape at risk. So you want to automate this to be reliable. Um, now, what is continuous delivery about? Um, it's um, a set of excellent patterns, um, best practices that can help you to um, deploy in a reliable and safe way. Um, that's why I told here, it's a journey. It's not an end point. Those patterns and those best practices are things that, are, that keep evolving. Um, your architecture evolves, your code evolves, so you're, you're not, uh, not ever at a point where you can say, now we have continuous delivery, it's a journey. Um, and we are not at the point that I can tell you all the answers um, because we are in the midst of that journey um, and I think we have a long way to go. Um, but it's a lot of fun. So I can tell you something about the journey, about the things, the obstacles we've faced and how we managed to deal with them. Um, what are the benefits of continuous deployment or continuous delivery? Um, the time to value, you can uh, deploy very fast, so you can deliver the value to the customer very fast. Your quality, you can uh, do it in a repeatable way, so you get it um, uh, in the testing stage and you get no surprises when you go to production. You have a cost reduction when you have those 100 pipelines with microservices and you have a lot of manual tasks. Your team to deploy will be very big and very, be a very costly task to do. And you can do some data-driven decision-making. You have more data from the automated tasks to see in production and in uh, the testing stages um, how your code is running, and you can act on that. Well, how do we start? Um, typically, you can say, well, we have a culture. It's a set of values, beliefs, principles. Um, derived from the culture, you have some practices, the behaviors. Uh, and actions that we derive from that culture. And lastly, you have the tooling, and the tooling should fit your practices. Um, what we always try or tend to do is try to change culture. So when Agile was first introduced, everybody said, well, you have to think small. And then you think, well, how do I think small? You can't just change culture, it's something that doesn't happen. You can't think small because someone says it. You have to learn how to do that. So there's an model that just changes this around. It says, well, first start with your tooling. And from your tooling, let it be pushed to practices. And from those practices, you can change culture. So if you have tooling to easily deploy your software, 
you will see that business gets more um, deployed software more often, and then business starts thinking of it as fun, um, and they get trust in the concept, and then in the end, they will think smaller because they learned how to do that. Um, it's a great model for me because it means we can focus on tooling, and that's much more fun than changing culture. So we can just get a tool and we say, well, we have a model that says it's the best to start with a tool. Um, so um, uh, we just got a bunch of tools when we started with CD. Um, that's what we can do. We can just buy some tools and we can ask people, well, here's a tool, use it and see where it goes. Uh, that's easy, that's not hard. Um, but what was the result? Um, the model is not really great at all um, uh, facets because uh, it led to incomplete tests. Um, some testers were very um, conscious about their test um, set, but others were not. <laughs> um, we had no branching, um, no monitoring, no logging, um, and we have no compliance or control. So in the end, we just had one trunk. Everybody is uh, committing code to the trunk. There are some tests, but they are not complete. And at the end of the day, automatically the code gets run into production. Um, that was not the best decision to make, I think, because this is very uh, unreliable, very risky. I'm not sure how we managed to still make it in that way, because it's currently how we go to production. Everybody who commits just does it in the trunk, and the next day it's in production. Um, so it's dangerous. Um, and that's why you have to do it another way. Um, my advice to you, if you would start with continuous delivery, is that you would um, see it as a software project because it's automating your deployment, so you have to see it as a software project. And what we've learned about delivering software is that you have to do it in an agile way. So if you are going to automate your deployment, please treat it as a software project. Have a product owner, have stakeholder management, have a backlog. Um, because what, we, what we've had was something I call the bamboo model. I don't know if you've ever seen how bamboo grows, but it's just one string that suddenly rises like three meter in a week time and leaves all the other strings behind. Um, that's what we did. We had some people with some tooling and they um, were very passionate about it because the people we have, um, uh, some people think, well, this is cool stuff. And they uh, find out how to use it and they get passionate about it and it's cool learning new stuff. So some of the people just on their own made the whole journey without the other people coming along. And that's exactly what happened. We had no one who was interested in, in visibility because we had no production situation. Nobody was um, paying any attention to monitoring because there was nothing to monitor. Other people were very passionate about testing, but um, uh, the first thing they thought they could um, uh, take away was the uh, acceptance testing because that's a hard task. We have to go to business people and ask them to do some acceptance testing and we don't really like that so if we can get that away from our build pipeline that's great. Um, so it was like so a, a scattered um, uh, delivery of continuous delivery. Um, you should do that differently. Um, because I found this as only one step from sublime to ridiculous. And I think what we have right now is ridiculous. Um, on the other hand, I think with some small steps, we can be more sublime and we can make this continuous delivery happen. Um, what we are also doing right now, um, promise everything, deliver nothing. Um, I think um, the last time we went to production was the 24th of May. Uh, we had some time where we could go every day, but a green build was some time ago right now. Um, we are going this Monday again, and then we are going to go nightly. That's better. Um, but right now, uh, it was broken at time, and nobody was paying attention to it, because everybody was making code. Nobody was paying attention to actually um, getting the code to production. Um, so make a backlog. Um, get your minimum viable product right. Set stages in your continuous deployment or your continuous delivery. You don't have to do it all at once. If you go from um, quarterly to monthly, that's a huge step. If you go from monthly to weekly, that's another use, a huge step.
step, and it's enough. If you go, um, if you break it down, and if you automate some of the tasks, uh, well, that's just another step in the right direction. Um, and make sure that the full line is, in order, is right at that point, that you have the right uh, automated tasks. You don't have to maybe deploy all your systems at once in a continuous way. You could also start with um, some of the systems you de deploy most frequently, um, because the value of continuous delivery is uh, highest at that point. So prioritize. Um, and let it be a team effort. Um, in our um, experience, you need almost one person in a team of six, seven people to pay attention to continuous delivery. Uh, he should um, uh, be aware of breaking builds. He should um, get the team enthusiastic to fix the broken builds. Um, he should be passionate about um, new tooling um, that can be used. Um, so be green at all times, fix the build at all times, and make the team um, see that as a priority. So use it in your daily standup, uh, see if the build broke, and if it does, fix it. Um, and in the agile development also is stakeholder management. So make sure uh, business is aligned because they have to invest money in this. Uh, I got a lot of questions from the directors of the company about the investments we've made. Um, make sure developers are aligned because they have to do things. They have to make new, um, new monitoring. They have to uh, do things differently. They have to have code coverage, unit code coverage. They should have that already, but now this is, gets more obligatory. Operations should be aligned. Um, and of course, don't forget compliance, IT security, and accountants. We totally forgot about those people, and they're also giving me a headache, because accountants don't like continuous delivery. They have no control over what gets to production. Uh, they used to have a big um, uh, document with all these uh, autographs of people who are authorizing the bill, and now they are lacking this information. That's not good. Uh, an important question is who owns the product? Uh, who to make a product owner of this thing? Um, because continuous delivery is not really something we put out there for the customer. Customers are the developers. But if you make a developer a product owner, this leads to a culture clash with the operations people who have to automate a lot of the tasks. Uh, because developers and operations are not really the same, well, not really the same thing. Um, so, um, I tried with a CTO for a time. Sander was a long time product owner. Uh, at a certain point, he was just sick of it because they didn't really do what he told them to do. Um, <laughs> it was, it was hard. <laughs> and that, right now, I'm the product owner because they listen to me. Um, I'm the boss, so that's easy. Um, but it's still, it's not really what you want because I have other things to do. Um, so, I really didn't find an answer to that question, who owns the product of continuous delivery? You should pay attention to that point, because it's important. Um, so, um, continuous delivery often tends to be too focused, um, often tends to be an IT thing, uh, but it isn't. Um, it will change your culture, and you have to uh, watch how your people um, evolve in this process. Um, I found this picture, are they ready or not? Um, mostly the IT staff is more ready than corporate culture. Corporate culture isn't ready at all for this concept. Um, technology and processes are somewhere in the middle. Um, and you have to learn a lot of stuff. If you want to automate this, um, you have to do a lot of new things, which are cool, but um, it's a lot to take. So um, make sure you have time to do this. Um, and you have to collaborate in other ways. As you can see here, uh, the amount of integration leads to more collaboration between the people who are playing a role in each part of the process. So you have to also make sure you manage that. Um, how did we do that? We had teams and we made them DevOps teams. Um, and we have guilds among them um, of similar people who work together. So the operations can work together uh, while still being part of a team to deliver software. Um, you should do that. It's easy to do. It's not hard. Um, 
And we have hackathons. Um, it's like knowledge sessions. Uh, we, give, we invest the time and the people to uh, take each other along and one member of the team, one member of the guild, get some space free to invest um, a new subject or a new tool or a new concept. And um, he's asked to organize a hackathon and he explains the new concept to the other people and they try uh, hands-on to make it work. So this is like how we got the elk stash, stash working. Um, one member just um, uh, got into it, dived into deep, and then uh, along with the other team members, it was working in one day. So that was cool. Um, and we have some knowledge events. Um, this was a tweet on Sunday. <laughs> um, where we uh, ask uh, different people to um, uh, just uh, give a presentation about a new subject. So uh, the first knowledge event was about a year ago, 11th of November, 2015. Um, and we got something about Docker, exploratory testing, and functional programming. And the value of it isn't really measurable. You should just invest the time, invest the, give people space to invest new technologies. You can just do that within the company. You could also get an, a speaker from outside. But people are um, loving to just invest in new concept themselves. So I would really advise that. Um, and then in the end, you will get your culture change. Um, one of the things we struggled hard with was the, comp the, the combination of microservices and continuous de uh, deployment. Um, at first delivery, uh, CD was for us, um, uh, well, it was hard but doable. Uh, there were some tasks that had to be automated and you have to automate your tests. Um, we said that every commit which is green, we uh, integrate with all the other um, stuff that is out there in the pipeline. Uh, we do a full test every night and every morning we can go to production. Um, that's good. Uh, we got some peer reviews in it. Uh, we have a diversity of test stages and I will get to that later. Um, and um, uh, we just go to production every morning, so that's fine. Um, at that point, it was good enough. Uh, the combination, uh, oh yeah, um, with the JIRA board, we have an integration with the workflow. Every time um, something that's built gets um, to acceptance, um, then the integration uh, through the pipeline gets triggered, so automatically. The code is annotated with the JIRA item on the board, so uh, when this item uh, moves to acceptance in workflow, uh, we uh, trigger the build and then we see if the build is still green and if it's true, then we go to production. Um, and then the responsibility for a team is to fix the build immediately because if you go, uh, if you want to go to production and you integrate it with the latest version of each of the components, um, well, you have to make sure you can go the next day and you can't be the one to be waiting for, for all the teams. So you have to fix the build when it gets broken directly, just leave everything behind. Um, and we made some um, configuration file to say, well, we have a lot of components and a lot of applications, and every time something gets committed, uh, we just update the configuration file with a new version of the, um, uh, of the app, right here, new version of the component, and uh, that is the configuration file that then uh, gets deployed to production. That was nice. Um, the problem came when somebody asked, well, it's nice that you can just move along the pipeline and deliver every time something gets finished, but what if you want to wait with shipping that feature? Um, well, that was, that was one that was hard to answer. Um, because we integrate with the latest version of each uh, application and component, um, and that one goes to production, there's another mechanism to make sure we can wait until we go to production. Um, so what we do is just we deliver all these things uh, and when everything gets accepted, um, it gets into production. Um, but what we want to do, um, we have microservices and we want to individually deploy them and individually get them out there. Uh, we don't always want to integrate with all the other microservices in the swarm. Um, so how do we do that? Oh, that's a checkmate situation. I think you can remember uh, the uh, story about somebody who wants to have some rice on every um, thing on the checkboard. 
and that the amount of rice that you get from that um, gets tremendously big. Um, well, that's the situation where we are in. If you have just two components, you can um, try to combine them all, and you could um, see if the integration tests are still green, and then the customer can just choose which one to deliver. If he wants to deliver this combination, that's fine. Uh, if he thinks he wants to deliver uh, both of the new versions, that's also fine, because they are all tested together. But if we want to test each microservice uh, in collaboration with all the other microservices, well, we get the amount of version of each microservice. Well, let's say each of them has two. Um, and we get the amount of microservices. Um, and we have right now 100, but we are still counting. I think we are going to reach at least 200, maybe 400. Um, this leads to trillions and trillions of years to run an integration test. It's impossible to test each version of the microservice with uh, all the other possible uh, combinations. Um, so if you want to do that, you have to have another stage. You have to have a stage where you can uh, first try in isolation um, what the effect is of the microservice, and then you have to have a stage where you can do a union test uh, with the really shippable product after, after the decision uh, that we want to ship. So there's an extra phase. Um, but this has some downsides, because if you want to do this, um, you're extending your continuous integration. So you want to integrate more often, and the effect is that you're integrating less often. That's not, not what you want. Um, so um, right now, um, what you would do is each application has its own pipeline, and if you only, at this point, for the first time, integrate, um, that's too late. That's not what you want. Um, you get some kind of hidden silos where you don't want to be in because there are all these hidden bugs and you think, uh, you tell your customer, well, we can ship these features, and then in the end you're surprised with a whole bunch of bugs you didn't see coming. Um, so what you want is instant delivery when you can. Uh, a lot of changes, like moving a button, or um, changing the name of a label. There's no reason to um, do that later. You can do that instantly. So please directly deliver when possible in a microservice landscape. Uh, everything that's um, more a back-end thing or a thing we can deliver because it can be shipped right away, uh, just ship it. Uh, leads to less headaches. Um, and what we do is when we have something that should be shipped later, then we could make a feature branch, and then we could make it possible to ship it later um, in the collaboration with the other features that are playing a role in that. So cherry pick your dust clouds, um, cherry pick your um, uh, combination of microservices that's feasible to go into production. Um, well, you have to get business aligned. It's a hard task. Um, it's almost often I think it's often forgotten to get business aligned because it's an IT thing to deploy software. Business was, not, was never really um, uh, a part of the deployment. They just saw things going wrong, but they didn't see how um, manually the tasks were or how hard the tasks were. Um, so try to tell the story. Try to get people, um, they are one part of the pie. You have stakeholder alignment. It's not just an IT thing. Most people in IT understand why you want this, but you have to get business at the table. Um, because what, they, what we experienced they were doing, um, they said, well, uh, with releases, we don't trust you. We know that when there's a release, we find lots and lots of bugs. So we want extensive periods to do some user ex uh, acceptance testing, because we always find things. That's true, of course. Um, and we want documentation. We want a system. Um, instruction document, um, and we want to give instructions to users how to use the system. Um, and we had a lot of um, talks about this. They also want a fallback scenario, a fallback plan, how to take the software out of production. Um, this is really something um, you should weekly talk about with your users. You can tell them, well, if every cha change is small, um, then you really don't have to instruct the users. They can understand how it works. If a button changes with the, uh, the name on the button, uh, most users still understand how to use the application, of course. Um, and stop documenting. We have to sell that to the people. Um, a, 
a system that isn't usable without documentation isn't a good system. So build the system properly, then users don't have to have the documentation. Um, if you have to sell that point of documentation, you're not doing your job right. Um, and you get your manual user acceptance testing. Um, well, you should also there try to build a trusting relationship with business. Um, where you can say, well, let us decide what features you should really manually uh, test because we think they are more risky. Um, and you have to have an idea of what your risky changes are. And I think we have an idea of what the risky changes are. So if you just make sure you communicate about it, you will make your way to it. Um, a fallback scenario for something that's um, uh, one day's work to create, uh, a piece of code that took you one day to create and deliver, uh, you shouldn't have a fallback scenario. You should just fix the mistake you made and always move forward. Uh, there's no reason to go back, then fix the problem, and then go forward again. So also there you have to explain this to the people. Um, and you have to make sure you can speed up delivery. Um, so um, just try to... Uh, don't try to go um, 120 miles per hour just uh, from zero, because Business doesn't get the concept right enough at that point. So make sure you just um, are going faster and faster. Start with little changes and deliver them directly, um, and then um, gain some trust. Um, make some technological, some small changes, make some technological changes, um, and deliver them directly, and you will also gain trust, um, which makes the way for bigger changes to follow the same pattern. Um, What's important to us, uh, which we found out along the journey, is that the product owner should approve your automated test sets. Uh, where testing was someone um, who tried to test the system and then hand it over to the business and he would do his own tests. Now your acceptance testing is uh, what the business um, relies on. So you have to um, do that together with someone who knows his stuff. Um, because they have different scenarios in mind, uh, it's also very, um, um, le very good for the tester to know what the scenarios are that the business is interested in. So get your product owner with the tester and make the um, ultimate acceptance tests together. Um, and if you know you're doing something risky, then um, get the product owner at the table and uh, let them pre-accept the um, uh, functionality. Because if it's risky, you could just ask early. Um, and get a smart change releasing strategy. Um, if you have something that's enabled with a form or something, you could do all the background tasks and you could deliver them already. Uh, it does nothing as long as the form that um, uh, uses all the background code uh, isn't there yet. So if you uh, think about releasing smart, you can also do that uh, without um, getting um, a products that can be shipped later because you want to avoid products that can be shipped later. Um, and um, I saw this one at the airport on the way here. Uh, make it uh, a priority to talk about CD and to work uh, on CD. So start with the quick wins on CD and um, give them uh, some reliable releases. And what you could also do is just screw up some of the traditional releases. We don't have to do much effort to manage to do that. Um, so they can get more of the value to um, get to automated uh, uh, deployments. Um, then something about testing. Um, continuous deployments or continuous delivery is all about the quality gates. You have to make sure that what goes into production uh, is safe, or at least safe enough, because some bugs will always appear out there. Um, and you have all these types of testing, um, where you can, um, uh, which you can make into four quadrants. Um, we have some functional testing. Of course, we want to know um, if we are uh, giving the business what they want. Uh, we also want to know if the, uh, pro the programmer wants to pre-test everything. They don't want to hear from the tester what goes wrong. So he wants to do some unit testing. Uh, this is more technology facing. This is more business facing. And this both supports programmers. And then we have things that are critiquing the product. Um, and there we are doing some uh, usability testing, some exploratory testing, uh, and we are here doing some performance load and security testing. Um, we totally did not make this side of the quadrant yet. We first focused on this. 
that's what you get when the product owner is someone from uh, IT, I think. Um, I think it's not a problem to do this later, because your performance testing, your load testing, um, uh, will get there along the way. Uh, you can do that manually if you uh, can choose to not release every day. You can do that weekly with traditional strategy, and you just um, can make this a lower prioritization. Um, then something about the testing architecture. What's important is that you have to split into test phases. Um, what we see now is that an integration test runs already about two to three hours. We just have one product in production uh, at the point. Um, two to three hours for an integration test with, um, I don't know, a few hundred commits a day uh, would mean that the build would never, the integration test would never be finished. There were, will always be more commits uh, waiting to be integration tested with another um, uh, release candidate than that we can manage to uh, run tests um, in the, the, the amount of time is just too short. So you have to split into test phases. First you do your, your um, uh, quick testing, the things where you can uh, get your regression, uh, your API, um, uh, where you can see where you made a mistake. Um, and then uh, uh, everything that breaks the build, you want to do this early. And everything that's more about, did we build the right thing? Uh, you can just extend that to later because um, it's not a breaking build, it's just not the right thing. Uh, it's less bad. Um, you can um, uh, test your, uh, of your, you can check your automated acceptance test with your product owner. I already told you about this. Um, you can monitor, of course, your unit test code coverage because the most of the programmers don't really like to make unit tests. That's not the fun part of programming. Um, so you can maybe try to um, make a sort of game of it. Um, maybe you can earn points with unit test coverage or something. Uh, make it fun, make it out there, but also you have to really monitor that it happens because your unit tests will um, get you the insight uh, of a breaking build early, so that's what you want to know early. It's really important to have those. Um, and um, uh, testing, of course, is code. Um, this is a sensitive point. We have all these testers who used to do things manually, uh, and now they have to automate their tasks. They are still testers. They are not developers. They don't really write the best code on average. Um, and if you just get the testers and they, you learn how to automate their tasks, um, the maintainability of the tests is not really very great. So actually you will need someone from development to guard what they are programming because it has to be maintainable because otherwise you get the same problems we used to get um, in functional programming before object orientation and everything um, where testing gets the new bottleneck. So you have to make sure the testers are enabled to automated test. So, um, what did we do in the pipeline? Well, we have um, uh, the first testing stage is a code review, um, where peer-to-peer -peer review it just gets uh, most of the errors out. Uh, then we deploy, um, and then we get to a local development uh, area, uh, where we do our unit tests, uh, and we can see which builds uh, are breaking. Um, then we promote them, only if they are green, of course, uh, to the integration test, uh, where we run a nightly uh, integration test on a full uh, set of code. Um, if this one is green, it gets promoted to the test um, situation, um, where, we can use, where we can even more extensively uh, test the code with the in integration tests and the, use, uh, the, the user acceptance testing, the automated user acceptance testing. And then in the end, we do the user acceptance testing. So if someone wants to check something manually uh, after the promotion to acceptance, they have one day. Um, that's something you have to align with business. You have to make sure they are committed to doing their user acceptance testing in one day because next day we want to ship. Um, what's the test tooling we are using? Well, for unit testing, we use JUnit. Um, for Serenity, you get some reporting about our tests. Uh, we use JBehave for our scenario testing, integration testing, API testing, um, and we use Selenium for our user interface testing. Um, we used to use SOAP UI and Fitness. We tried those. Um, they aren't recommendable because they were 
uh, too hard for most testers to understand, um, and they led to um, very uh, not maintainable code. So I wouldn't advise those. Um, and you want to um, keep an eye on the pyramid of tests, because manual testing is slow, you want to minimize that. Um, your UI testing is also slow, you have to do a lot of tasks there. Uh, you don't want too much of that, you have to have some, because you do want to make sure you don't get all those errors out there, of course. Um, so, um, I think this is a famous pyramid. Um, and you want to see uh, if any regression uh, is there, um, if your APIs are still working, uh, if your integration is working. Um, but you have to um, uh, have the, the, the broadest uh, test set in your unit test, because this is the earliest stage where you can see something is going wrong. In the pipeline you saw just now, this is the first thing that's get, that gets run. So you want to have a lot of these, so you can um, fast see what's going wrong. Um, what we see is, uh, uh, what we often also see is an ice cream of tests. This is not what you want. A lot of manual testing, a lot of UI testing, um, and then if you want to get out of this situation, invest here. Make sure you can gain some trust, first make it a silo. Uh, make sure your unit tests are more cover in your code, uh, so that people can um, get away from the UI testing and the manual testing. Um, then we invested something in code review. Um, we started with a procedural code review where we just asked the developers to check on one another. Uh, this was in the workflow, so on the Jira, Jira board we had a, a developer test uh, stage. And um, people try to review another, but they are really very kind for one another. So they are not really um, telling others when the, the code is not really so good. Uh, so you want something more. Uh, you can use the procedural phase to set some standards, of course. Um, you can use it to uh, talk a little bit about what is quality, what is code quality, and you can uh, get the conversation out there between developers. Uh, but what helps better is some tooling. So we use Sonar to see code coverage, to see um, uh, automatically what uh, kind of errors you just shouldn't make. Um, and Sonar, um, keeps you from uh, a green uh, deployment. So uh, you can't deploy your code if Sonar isn't green. Um, and uh, recently we looked into some tooling, uh, Upsource, Crucible, and Garrett. Um, and we chose for Upsource. Um, I think the investigation was about three weeks ago. Um, Upsource is a new tool uh, which um, uh, collaborates nicely with IntelliJ. Um, and it really gives good feedback to uh, the programmer and good insights to the reviewer. Um, Crucible and Garrett have some advantages because they can do the check pre-commit um, and Upsource only can do the check post-commit. This is a downside of the product, but it shows you the changes, not only the delta, but uh, the changes in full. Uh, and that's uh, really an upside, so you should really look into Upsource. Then we have logging monitoring. Um, well, we started on this quite late, because we weren't in production, we didn't have a brownfield operation, but a greenfield operation. So, um, we just started working on, the, uh, on monitoring after production. That's a little bit too late, I would advise you to do that a little bit earlier. Um, well, why do we need it? We need it for um, uh, metrics, decision making. Uh, we need it for information on our CD process. Uh, we need to know what breaks the build, we need to know which version is where, uh, we need to know um, which, are, uh, uh, which builds are making the uh, processes uh, small, uh, uh, slow or which uses an extensive amount of uh, infrastructure. So we need some uh, uh, monitoring on our applications. Um, we chose for the Elk stash. Uh, as I told you, uh, in one hackathon we got it working, um, so it's easy. We didn't look into any other um, monitoring, so I can't advise if this is the best one. But I think it's pretty good if you can get it working in one day. Um, and um, we are now just building up uh, our uh, monitoring uh, network, and it's easy, it's good usable. Um, the Elk stash is about uh, Logstash. Um, uh, Elasticsearch um, and Kibana, where Logstash 
just um, gets all the uh, logging information together, uh, translates it into uh, a form that's usable. Um, then it gets um, uh, to Elastic, where you can uh, get it in a database and get it uh, searchable and indexable. Uh, then you can make it visible with Kibana. Kibana is the thing we see as developers. Um, and it has a nice interface, it's very uh, uh, lightweighted. Um, and, um, well, this is your logging information. Uh, this is a screenshot of Kibana. This is how it shows the information to you after the translation and the uh, uh, persistence. Um, and as I said, it's lightweight. You can easily make these kinds of graphs and they are real time. Um, they give you direct feedback. Um, this is a nice touch. Um, What's important is that you get developers to um, uh, also look into this uh, monitoring because they are responsible for running code in production. Um, so what you want is that they talk along about what our metrics are valuable to us. Um, because if operations decides what metrics are valuable, uh, mostly they don't get the thing right. You know as a developer what you want, uh, what you need to uh, get the responsibility of working software in production. So ask them uh, what metrics uh, are working good for us. Make it a team effort again. Um, so that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, oh, I think you can. Uh... Oh, thanks. There you go. I put it on already. Yeah. I'm wondering uh, what are the business results in the end? Like, Sorry, what are the business results? Like time to market, quality level, etc. Why you were doing all this? How has it changed? Yes, it's um, uh, of course about. Um, <laughs> it's about. Um, uh, firstly, it's about quality. Um, you can make the build repeatable, and I've often seen that code runs well, your release candidate runs well in the testing phase, in the acceptance stage, and then still breaks in production, because you have another version running there, or another configuration, or something. Um, but mostly because somebody just made an error with the promotion to production. So um, uh, if you automate the task, it gets repeatable and it gets predictable. Um, that's nice about continuous delivery. Um, except from quality, it's about um, the cost reduction. Uh, I think if you automate the tasks, you can go to production several times a day. That's our ambition. Oh, sorry. Um, well, no, we haven't. Uh, the question was, I don't think everybody can hear it. <laughs> Have we measured these results? No. Um, I wouldn't know how to, simply. Um, you can't see how much um, damage was created with the manual process. I know we had a lot of errors due to that. We had a lot of um, uh, uh, situations where the system was down for all users um, due to human error in the deployment process. Um, but how much money gets lost when the system is down, it's hardly measurable. Um, I know that, it, on the other hand, in the microservices architecture, uh, we wouldn't be able to deploy the microservices individually if we had a manual process. So for us, it was a situation where we just had to do it. Uh, but it's hard to measure. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I will repeat the question. I don't know if everybody can hear it. Uh, you could measure the number of bugs in production, number of times to production. I think the second metric uh, is interesting. We can measure that easily. Um, um, but you can still. Uh, the metric doesn't say anything about if it's valuable. If you go to production every day instead of every uh, month. Um, how much value gets added to production, uh, to, uh, to business. Uh, that's hard to measure. So 
uh, yes, you can see, hey, and then look, uh, now we go to production every day, but how, what's the money worth, the money value of that? Uh, that's hard to say. The first one, the amount of bugs in production, uh, that's even harder. It could be that you get more bugs in production due to continuous delivery. Uh, that's not a strange thing, because if you go to production every day, you, and if you can fix it every day, um, then maybe you are willing to take more risk. Um, because if I know I can fix something that gets broken, then why should I invest in three months of testing uh, if I can fix it the next day? So um, I saw a quote where somebody said, um, uh, I hardly ever test, but when I test, I do it in production. Uh, and yeah, there's something about that. Oh. I think this is <laughs> more handy. Oh, I think it switched off. Whoop. <laughs> uh, so you said that you uh, had some review of uh, uh, like code review tools. So why didn't it suffice for you GitHub review? So that's easy. And it's out of the box with the GitHub repository. Why that doesn't suffice like code review like wanted? Um, oh, sorry, I didn't hear the name of the tool because the Mac GitHub review. GitHub. Oh yeah, this is Garrett. Ah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <I just laughs> that is the GitHub um, uh, tooling. We investigated it. Uh, it's, uh, we took two weeks to get Garrett running, mm -hmm. even only running. We couldn't review it because the operations couldn't get it working. Um, so it was hard to install. Um, and when we got it working, um, well. I thought it was cool because it was my favorite option, Garrett, um, because it um, uh, gives you the likes and the dislikes from people and you can say, well, uh, only with so many likes we can go to production, we can promote. Um, it's intuitive in that way. Um, and what it had was you can um, do it pre-commit, so that's also nice. Um, but the downsides were, um, uh, you need feature branching for it. Uh, we don't have feature branching yet, so it would be a big change for us for something so small as a peer review tool. Um, anyway, we have to fix that, so maybe later Garrett gets more usable for us. Um, and um, it didn't show your changes in your IDE. That was a downside. Uh, Upsource just shows you the changes in full context, um, which makes it usable for uh, developers. Interesting. Uh, and another question is regarding uh, like drawback. When you do greenfield, uh, like uh, you fully create a new product, you always suffer some functionality, and you have left some abandoned uh, system with have existing data, existing requests, which still. So how did you proceed it with that one? So basically, it was some integration which was fetched into the new system, and new system they people been able to serve only particular requests or something like that. So how that was managed in terms of like usability. So basically how you convince the business people who were uh, using a legacy system which was doing everything. And here is a new feature which cut off of many features that they had already in place. And right now they need to only use partially that. Yeah, um, that's a complex question because it's uh, uh, a lot of effort to do that. Um, what we did was we got a, a user panel early in the development stage uh, and we showed them the intermediate results we had um, uh, and they could shoot at it. They could say, uh, well, I don't like this, I miss this. Um, and they just could put it on the backlog. Uh, so they added it to information uh, that the product owner had um, and um, uh, what we also asked them was uh, when the backlog got more than a thousand items, I think, after a period of, <laughs> a period of feedback, uh, we asked them to prioritize those items. Um, so we asked them to make a top 15, uh, which gave us insights in what drives the business, what's uh, key to them. Um, and that was nice because uh, I think we've learned something from that. Um, were a lot of things we wouldn't have expected uh, to make it to the top 15. So we learned to think uh, differently about what business wants. 
um, some one member of uh, business who is uh, the manager of the, the, the user panel group is every day at our stand up um, so uh, he hears what we are doing and he can give uh, direct feedback uh, like uh, think about this or think about that he also um, comes at some design sessions uh, where a lot of uh, usability uh, aspects are then we invite him to sit at the table and give uh, direct feedback before we build it. So it's a whole complex of things to make sure that they are uh, not losing too much of the features they were used to. But you have to be careful with it because they ask to they ask for a system that works precisely as they were used to. So if you build what they ask, you don't get the improvements you are striving for. Yes. It's like the quote, uh, if I would have asked people what they wanted, they said, a uh, faster horse. Uh, never, never would anybody come up with a car, because a car is something they don't know. Um, so be careful when you ask uh, feedback from users, that you don't let them um, decide what the view on the product is. There's the product owner uh, who has to play a role in that. Yeah. Thank you. Any more? Um, I'm wondering how long did the project for transition to microservices took? Um, let's see, we tried since 2000 until uh, 2014 in a diversity of projects to make an insurance system. Um, some were more uh, valuable than others. Um, uh, in 2014 we started with uh, concurrently the agile adoption uh, microservices architecture uh, with uh, JSON um, uh, uh, for interfacing. Uh, we started with DevOps and we started with continuous delivery. Mm -hmm. So we can't really say what was the um, critical success factor, of course. But since 2014, we are now, um, well, halfway 2014, we could start. So uh, we went to production last May, uh, so it took us about two years. Um, and um, uh, to have a full insurance system, which is a big system. So I think we can be um, satisfied with that, that result. And we have a lot of building blocks where we can now just plug new features in. So that goes fast. Yeah? Thank you very much. Oh, I think uh, he was first. <laughs> uh, a question. Uh, what cloud provider do you use? Sorry. What, what cloud provider do uh, you use? Are you on Amazon on-premise or...? Uh, uh, yeah, we do everything on-premise. On-premise. Uh, yeah. oh, what, what do you use for, uh, for cloud, OpenStack? No, we do everything on-premise. So on bare metal, you're on bare metal? Yes. Okay, so you, de you deploy uh, every individual microservice on a virtual machine or? Yeah, we have uh, our hosts, our uh, ESXs are um, on-premise, yep. uh, but we have virtualized all our servers. So we can just containerize them all and we can, um, uh, we are also prepping for containerization um, and we have this virtual infrastructure where we can just plug into it. Um, and we have, uh, what, what do you use for, the, for this virtualization? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'll ask okay. them when I get back. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I was wondering so. if you changed something in that in during this transition to a new architecture. Uh, probably there are some tips as, as well. Yeah, th yeah, thank you. We'll okay. talk later. Uh, just a side question regarding uh, environment, so infrastructure. So basically, you choosing to go with on-premise, uh, but uh, technically, everyone knows that on-premise it demands like uh, operations to fix the scene. So how often uh, you get in out, uh, get some faults uh, because of that things? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> he's laughing very hard because we have a lot of conversations about this, of course. Uh, running on-premise is a bad idea. It's something I inherited from um, uh, all the people before me because, um, uh, well, we are we have our own ideas and they, we are very convinced of them. And cloud was something we also thought of was uh, a dirty word for a long time. So we didn't go 
do anything in the cloud. It was one of the forbidden words. And we think we have more control when we um, have everything on premise because then <laughs> somebody can actually uh, go to the machine and touch it. <laughs> And then uh, we have the feeling of control, but it's really a bad idea because you have to know everything about everything. Um, and uh, maybe that's possible if you have a really big company, but we aren't so big. We have only seven people running all the infrastructure. Um, and what we see is uh, more and more problems running it safely. Uh, I'm sorry, just, just another question uh, regarding Basically, if the decision to run on-premise was not related to security, I mean a non-trust to the cloud providers actually, because many customers, especially which is related to like uh, banking, like legal, formally, like in 2012, 2014, they were very scared to move their resources onto the cloud because of that. Have them, that yes. been a case, like main case for, you, for your company? Um. Uh, if I understand correctly, you're asking is security the main reason to be on premise? Like putting private data into the cloud. So basically moving like something like financials, like uh, all the stuff of that. Yeah, customer data, I mean. Okay, yeah. Well, um, uh, it's true that it was one of the reasons we didn't go look into the cloud a long time. We are at the late adopters in the hype cycle. Um, uh, because at first, uh, the uh, people who control insurance companies, there's a lot of um, uh, looking into that, of course, um, they were uh, hesitating about going to the cloud with your uh, consumer data, all the things that are very privately. Um, and um, uh, what was an upside for us is that we missed all the hassle about it. So we didn't have the hard conversations like how much data is in the cloud and how are you sure that it's safe and it's secure. Um, so uh, it saved a lot, of, a lot of trouble on that side. But right now, um, I think we are hopping on too late because um, uh, we found ways to cope with that. Uh, you can um, make sure you get parties uh, which are safe or safe enough. Um, or on the other hand, I don't really trust the seven people I have working more um, than um, some cloud provider which has maybe 300 people to look after security. <laughs> those seven at my company aren't better than those 300 at Amazon or something. You know, so I think you could really uh, take that step and I'm looking into it right now. I think uh, we're not so far away from it to go uh, with our first steps into the cloud. Uh, just last question regarding uh, that you working on premise and it stops you from moving to cloud. Why not just build VPC with IPsec and push everything <laughs> outside and nothing is breaking? Because if you have microservices, just not do that simple step. It should take probably a couple days. Yeah, that's true. Well, we should yeah, we should really look into it because also uh, upscaling and that kind of stuff uh, is much easier when you have it in the cloud because now we have our physical um, uh, yeah uh, uh, problems and uh, we even had to run our production database on a 40G uh, database which is ultra small <laughs> and we had one problem when we made a restore and the database just grew too big. Um, I think when you run it in the cloud, there's not such a problem with your um, amount of uh, uh, infrastructure. You can just scale up more easily, which is one of the concepts of microservices. So we should really do that, yeah. Yeah, but the problem is that you kind of almost in the cloud. So all you need is just do pull off. That's all. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Thank you. Applaudируем, <laughs> Kim.